Welcome to Douglas Wilson's The Plodcast. This audio is brought to you by Canon Press. Before we get started, I wanted to remind folks of the biggest and largest news of the Christian Heritage series, and that is that Gilbert Keith Chesterton, the G.K. Chesterton, has joined our Heritage series. You can grab G.K. Chesterton's Orthodoxy at canonpress.com. I can do no better than just reading the man's words himself. From Orthodoxy. Because children have abounding vitality, because they are in spirit fierce and free, therefore they want things repeated and unchanged. They always say, do it again. And the grown-up person does it again until he is nearly dead. For grown-up people are not strong enough to exult in monotony. But perhaps God is strong enough to exult in monotony. It is possible that God says every morning, do it again, to the sun. And every evening, do it again, to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately, but has never got tired of making them. It may be that he has the eternal appetite of infancy. For we have sinned and grown old, and our father is younger than we. Pick up G.K. Chesterton's Orthodoxy at canonpress.com. Welcome to the podcast, episode 151, 151. Hard to believe we've been going this long. This is coming up on three years. I can't believe it. Thank you for joining me. So what are we going to talk about this time? I I want to uh, continue an issue I brought up in the last uh, podcast, episode 150, um, when I was reviewing uh, Bastiat's book, The Law. in that review, I mentioned, I'll just state this to bring it up to speed and then develop it further. In that book, Bastiat says that the government is, the government is supposed to uh, limit itself to the protection of citizens' lives, their liberty, and their property, life, liberty, and property. And because of that limitation, that means that the government itself is limited. So if basically if the government is only about maintaining justice, then if you have a sharp, narrow, restricted view of justice, then that means you can have a a limited government. If you have a broad, expansive view of justice, that means that the government has to grow and expand in order to fulfill its obligation to provide justice. So if 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 it's unjust, for someone else to attack me and take my stuff, then the government's role is to prevent that from happening. All right, maintain law and order, track down burglars and, and murderers. That, that's what they do. If, however, uh, justice is defined as somebody else having a free supply of chocolate milk for life, then that means there's got to be a chocolate milk, milk supplier. That means somebody has an obligation to supply it, and somebody else, the government, has the need to stand behind the person who has to supply it, uh, ensuring that he does so. Okay. Now, that means government is, in principle, by definition, unlimited, or it's as unlimited as the greed of man. There's that passage uh, in Proverbs uh, where basically the pit opens its mouth and cries, more, more. Well, that's the way envy works. That's the way greed works. That's the way, uh, give me, that, that's the way it works when people have a bad case of the gimmies. Now, if you say this is what the civil government does, and this is all they're supposed to do, then somebody is going to say, and this is a a common retort, and it's important to have something ready to hand to respond to this retort. That doesn't sound very loving. That doesn't sound like compassionate. What doesn't the Bible say that we're to love our neighbor? And and shouldn't we be philanthropic? And shouldn't we 
Shouldn't we be open-handed and ready to give? And of course, the answer to that is yes, we should be giving. God has been gracious to us. He gave us salvation, which we didn't deserve. He gives us many, many blessings, which we don't deserve. And so we should be ready and eager to, to extend that same kind of grace to others. But here's, this is the hidden assumption. People assume that if you don't believe the state should do it, you don't believe it ought to be done. When people who talk this way, when they talk this way, they think that they are revealing your stone-cold heart. They think they are revealing how hard-hearted you are. What they're actually revealing is how much trust they put in the state. They are revealing that the state is their God. And, of course, if you are not worshiping their God, if you're not worshiping the God of coercion, then they, they regard this, by definition, as um, uh, impious and, and profane. And I, I need to insert something here. Uh, I, impious is, is uh, the word impious, I-M-P-I-O-U-S. And it's one of those words that's pronounced properly as impious. But you always have to qualify yourself because when you pronounce a word like that correctly, everybody thinks that you don't know that you're pronouncing it wrong. Um, impious is the right way to, to pronounce it. Impious, impious. So uh, people dismiss you as being profane and that you're disregarding the will of their God. But notice that there's a difference between uh, true philanthropy, true charity, where you voluntarily give your own goods away. You have $100 in the bank, and you see someone in need, and you take $95 out, and you give it, or you give all 100 to the person in need. That would be true generosity. That is genuine generosity. But if I see someone in need, and I vote for Murphy down the street to pay higher taxes so that Murphy can take care of him, to take care of the guy in need, and Murphy does so because there's a guy with big block letters on his jacket standing behind him with a gun. Uh, in what universe is that an exercise of charity? What I'm doing is I'm using the coercion of the law to coerce Murphy into giving money to somebody else because I think that somebody else needs it. That's not charity. That is evil. It's just wrong. So to um, assume that it is keeping with biblical ethics for us to adopt the ways of coercion when it comes to redistribution of wealth. That just shows how far we've drifted away from uh, what the Bible teaches. So, podcast 151, we come to hamartiology. You guessed it. Here we are. Back in the midst of hamartiology, our study of sin. This is our lawful study of sin, unlike the unlawful study of sin that we all engage in from time to time, which we shouldn't. So, our hamartiological study this time brings us to consider the meaning of aphrosune, aphrosune, which has been rendered in the King James as foolishly, foolishness, or folly. Foolishly, foolishness, or folly. It's interesting that. It's translated, it, the, the word is translated in three different ways, as an adverb, as an adjective, uh, um, no, ex excuse me, as, as an adjective, I'm sorry, as an adverb and as a noun. So I'm going to begin with the kind of foolishness that is manifestly sinful, a clear falling short of what God intends for us. Uh, Mark 7, uh, 21, verses 21 and 22. For from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. There it is, foolishness. Now look at the company that this foolishness keeps, and that is part of what makes it so foolish. We are talking about murder, theft, adultery, blasphemy, and so on. This kind of foolishness is really bad. It likes to hang out with bad characters. It likes to hang out with bad people. It likes to hang out with bad sins. But then we have a kind of, as it were, folly. I'll explain, that. I'll explain this as we go. It's a kind of, as it were, folly. This is sinful folly, but the Apostle Paul is simply pretending to be that way. 
It would be sinful if he really were, but he's not. But he's mocking. He, he's uh, setting a mock situation up. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11.1 1 says, Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. So Paul, Paul is not saying that he's genuinely foolish, but he is saying that he wants the Corinthians to bear with him in what is going to look to them like folly. It's, um, it's an as-it-were folly. The same word is used just a little later in the same chapter into the same effect in 2 Corinthians eleven seventeen, He says, That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly, in this confidence of boasting. I'm carrying on, and as it were, foolishly. And then in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty one, just a few verses after that, I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak. Howbeit, whereinsoever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. So when someone says, hey, listen, bear with me for a minute, I'm going to talk like I'm crazy, or I'm going to talk like a madman, I'm going to, talk, I'm going to ask your permission to speak a little more loosely and a little more freely than I ordinarily would, and I'm tagging it beforehand as foolish talk, but I want you to know that I'm self-aware of what I'm doing, and I'm doing it for a reason. So what you would ordinarily dismiss as true folly is not true folly. If Paul really were as foolish as he is feigning to be, that would have been bad. But he is saying that there is a kind of godliness that looks to be sinfully foolish to others, others of a certain type. And we learn godly wisdom from Paul by reversing the photo negative. So, in recent months, I've um, been going back to a few Francis Schaeffer titles that I read uh, many years ago in the 70s and 80s. And one such title that I've gone back to, I'm almost done with it again, is The Christian Manifesto by Francis Schaeffer. The Christian Manifesto by Francis Schaeffer. Uh, it's really striking. He wrote, the, wrote this book in the early 80s, and uh, he was lamenting the state of law in Western countries, particularly the United States, and the encroachments of the state. And um, it is amazing to me, listening to this book again, uh, and if, if you've not read it before, I think you need to read it. The fact that it's 40, almost 40 years old uh, doesn't keep it from being highly relevant. Some of the examples are obviously dated, but the principles are all like fresh grass in the spring. Um, it's amazing how relevant this book is. If you've read it before, and oh yeah, that was a good book back in the day, uh, go back and read it like I did. It's um, astonishingly relevant. What Schaefer is doing is he's identifying the great idol of our age, which is the state, uh, and he is bringing historic Protestant Reformed theology of civil resistance to bear on our relationship to the overweening state. He gets into all the issues, uh, civil disobedience, civil resistance. He refers to many of the uh, important characters in the development of the theology of this, uh, most notably uh, Samuel Rutherford's uh, Lex Rex, The Law is King. Um, Samuel Rutherford actually would have been executed for that book. Um, it, it was regarded as treasonous. It uh, challenged the theology of the divine right of kings, uh, because when you say the uh, uh, Lex Rex, you're saying the law is king, the law is over the king, uh, as opposed to the king is appointed by God to occupy that space, and you can't second-guess him for any reason. He can answer to God, but he, he does, certainly doesn't answer to you. Uh, that was the uh, uh, previous paradigm, and the only reason that Rutherford wasn't executed for arguing the way he did was he, uh, he died before they had an opportunity to execute him. He was um, summoned to a tri the king's tribunal, and he was uh, on his deathbed, and he sent a message. He sent his regrets. <laughs> um, he couldn't come to his tribunal. He couldn't come to his trial because he was going, he said, to heaven where few kings and great ones come. Uh, so Rutherford, Rutherford establishes a godly pattern of 
how Christians, Bible-believing Christians, are uh, to think about their relationship to the state. This is a, a, a strong tradition in Protestant theology, and sadly, it's largely forgotten. It was, it was the basis for, for our resistance to Great Britain in the uh, American War for Independence. Uh, one book by a French Huguenot from the 1500s was Vindicii contra Tyrannus, or A Vindication of Liberty Against Tyrants, uh, and then Rutherford's Lex Rex. Well, uh, Schaefer is very much drawing on this tradition, and, uh, and he makes good modern applications. Uh, basically, what it boils down to is there's the threefold, three stages of Protestant resistance to tyranny. The first is to protest it, to prophesy against it, to preach against it, to exhaust legal means for um, resisting. That's the first stage. The second stage is to flee. And if there's somewhere, this is why a lot of our forebears came to America. They fled religious persecution, and they fled because Jesus says, if you're persecuted in one city, flee to the next. So, Go. I don't don't let the door hit you. If if you've got a way of getting away to a place where this persecution is uh, not occurring, then feel free to avail yourself of it. And then the third um, uh, level is what Schaefer calls force, as opposed to violence. In other words, violent insurrection, an attempt to overthrow the existing authorities, is not permitted for a Christian. But a Christian can take up arms to defend himself forcefully but he he doesn't take the war to the enemy he doesn't try he doesn't try to overthrow the king he simply resists the king in much the same in much the way that king uh, king david before he was king david uh, fled from saul so did david honor the anointed status of the king saul well absolutely up to the point where he, he, his conscience smote him when he cut off a piece of Saul's robe. And uh, so he follows him out and says, I did this. And, uh, you know, he, his conscience bothered him that he even touched the king's cloak. But at the same time, if there was anybody who was not cooperating with what Saul wanted by not turning himself in, for example, uh, that would have been David. David had an armed band evading arrest, resisting arrest, not doing what Saul wanted at all. And yet, he was not, he, so he was using force to flee, and he would have defended himself had it come to that. All right, do you see that? So um, Paul had his, uh, his uh, small army, and if they'd been trapped in a canyon, they would have defended themselves, I'm sure. But he wouldn't ever have marched on Saul's capital city in order to. Um, overthrow Saul. He wasn't going to lift up his hand against the, the Lord's anointed. So, if you, if you are as troubled as you ought to be by recent events in our country, then now is the time to revisit the Christian Manifesto by Francis Schaeffer. It's very good. Mm-hmm.